So in this section, we'll look at the various blood types, A, B, and O grouping, as well as Rh positive and negative. The blood types and transfusion compatibility are a matter of interactions between plasma proteins and the erythrocytes, particularly cell markers on the erythrocytes. Now, it used to be that in blood transfusions, you'd give a transfusion and sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. Until 1900, when Carl Landsteiner discovered these blood types A, B, and O. He won a Nobel Prize for this. The blood types are based on interactions between antigens and antibodies. An antigen is a cell label and an antibody is something produced by the immune system that attacks that particular label when it's non-self. So blood antigens and antibodies. The antigens are complex molecules on the surface of a cell membrane that are unique to that individual. Of course, the exception is in identical twins. They're used to distinguish self from foreign, and most cells will present some sort of antigen. When we inject blood that is non-self, it displays an antigen that's different from the self cells, and thus it generates an immune response. Agglutinogens are antigens on the surface of the red blood cell that is the basis for our blood typing. Antibodies are proteins, particularly gamma globulins, that are secreted by plasma cells. They're part of an immune response to foreign matter. So the antibodies are going to bind to the antigens and mark them for destruction by other immune cells. This forms an antigen-antibody complex. Agglutinins are the antibodies that we find in plasma that bring about transfusion mismatches. Agglutination is when an antibody molecule binds to antigens and causes clumping of the red blood cells. So red blood cell antigens that are called agglutinogens are antigen A and antigen B and they're determined by carbohydrate moieties found on the red blood cell surface. So in type O blood, we have this agglutinogen, this antigen presented by the cell. All of these chains end in a galactose and a fructose. Not fructose, but fructose. Now, type A blood expresses a little bit different of a side group, the N acetyl galactosamine, whereas type B blood cells will present another galactose hanging off the side. Type A and B will have both types of labels, the A label, the A antigen, and the B label, the B antigen. Type O just has the regular straight chain of N acetyl galactosamine, galactose, and then fructose. Now, you don't need to memorize these galactose, fructose, and N-acetylglucosamine molecules. Just recognize that blood type A expresses a particular label, and blood type B expresses a different label on its surface. And blood type AB expresses both the labels of type A and type B. You'll probably remember some of this from general biology. So your ABO blood type is determined by the presence or absence of these particular antigens, otherwise called agglutinogens. Blood type A, the person has A antigens on the cell surface. In blood type B, the person has B antigens. In AB, they have both antigens. And in blood type O, they have neither of these antigens. Blood type O is the most common blood type, and the most rare blood type is blood type A. B. Now, the plasma antibodies, the agglutinins, are anti-A and anti-B. That is, a person that has blood type A that expresses the A antigen or A label on their cells will only be able to produce the antibody B or anti-B. And if that person receives a transfusion, of the wrong type of blood, that is one that has a B label on it, their immune system will form anti-B that will attack those cells.
This figure to the right shows how these antibodies act to attach to the red blood cells and then attach the red blood cells to each other, causing agglutination. So these anti-A and anti-B molecules will be found in the blood plasma and produced by the immune system. You won't make antibodies against your own antigens because the immune system remembers them as self. These agglutinins appear only two to eight months after birth and are at a maximum at 10 years of age. So we don't require exposure to our non-self blood type in order to form these agglutinins, anti-A and anti-B, which I think is interesting. Agglutinated red blood cells block the small blood vessels and hemolyze, and then they'll release their hemoglobin over the next few hours and days. This hemoglobin blocks the kidney tubules and causes acute renal failure. So transfusing the wrong blood is a big deal. Now, the universal donor is the type O blood. It's the most common blood type, and it lacks any red blood cell antigens, so there are no labels on it, except for that standard label. The donor's plasma may have both antibodies against the recipient's red blood cells. It might have anti-A and anti-B. Because of this, often packed red blood cells will be given with minimal plasma. That way, the anti-A or the anti-B that is in existence in the donor's blood won't be present to attack the recipient's blood. The universal recipient is type AB. This is the most rare blood type. Of course, these percentages vary around the world, which is most common and which is most rare, as they evolved in different places as mankind traveled across the earth. There's actually information to suggest that our diet should be based on our blood type. If someone wanted to pick that up as a presentation for the end of the semester, it's a great one. What type of food should type O be, and what type should type AB be, and what type should type B be? Myself, I recognize that it's not really possible for me to live as a vegetarian. That's because I stem from a region where vegetarianism was not part of our history. And I believe that that's tied into the blood type. When I look at my blood type, it does say indeed that I should eat a fair amount of red meat. I think that's an interesting topic. I'd love to hear more about it. A person's ABO blood type can be determined by placing a drop of blood in a pool of anti-A serum and a drop in a pool of anti-B serum. If we have anti-A serum here in this left column and anti-B serum here in this right column, then we can determine what the blood type is. If an individual has blood type A and we put their blood in anti-A serum, that is serum that contains the antibody to A, then it will coagulate or agglutinate. However, when we put their blood in a puddle of anti-B serum, which contains the antibody B, that blood type A does not possess the B antigen or the B label, and thus there's nothing to attack, so the blood will remain normal. If a person has blood type B, and we put their blood in a pool of anti-A serum, because their blood has no a labels, it will remain normal. But blood type B does express the B label, and thus, when dropped in a pool of serum labeled anti-B, it will agglutinate or coagulate. When we have blood type AB, it has both labels on it, so it will be attacked in the anti-A serum as well as in the anti-B serum and agglutinate. On the other hand, type O has neither label, so the anti-A serum will allow it to be normal, and also the anti-B, because it has neither labels on its cell surface. Now, this blood typing business can be fairly difficult to understand. I invite you to spend a little bit of time here. Perhaps close your book, close your notes, and write down these four different blood types. 
and identify what labels are on the surface of each of those blood types. And then in the serum of that person's blood, what antigens would exist. And also, if we were to do blood typing, what antibodies would the blood react to? I know it seems a little bit challenging, but as you try to put this puzzle together, it'll become evident. We'll also do a blood typing exercise in lab. So the RH group comes from the naming in the Roussy's monkey where it was first discovered. There are both C, D, and E agglutinogens that were discovered. D is the most reactive, and a patient's considered to be RH positive if they have the D antigen on their red blood cells. The RH frequencies also vary among ethnic groups. Among American whites, there's about an 85% frequency of RH positive, which means they have the D antigen on their cells. In Asians, it's about 99%. Anti-D agglutinins are not normally present in the plasma, as we saw with the ABO blood grouping. So that is, a woman's blood won't have agglutinins to D if she were RH negative. From an RH negative individual that's exposed to RH positive blood, we're going to see that these anti-D agglutinins or antibodies form. An RH negative woman with an RH positive fetus or who received a transfusion of RH positive blood will form anti-D agglutinins and that will attack the blood and cause them to glutinate. There are no problems with the first transfusion or the first pregnancy because it takes time for the immune system to respond because as I said those antibodies are not normally present in the plasma of the blood until the first exposure. Now if an RH negative mother has formed antibodies in the first pregnancy, then the second child comes along. <clears throat> These A antibodies can cross the placenta. Usually they won't do that during term. However, during birth there's mixing of fetal and maternal blood and the RH antibodies will attack the fetal blood, which causes severe anemia and toxic brain syndrome as their blood glutinates. We can prevent this from happening if we know that the mother had an RH positive fetus in a previous pregnancy by giving this substance called Rogam. It binds the fetal agglutinogens in her blood so that she won't form anti-D antibodies. And thus the fetus is protected. So again, spend a moment here and sort out the details of RH positive versus RH negative. Maybe do a little diagramming. If you have an RH positive mother or an RH negative fetus, what might happen? If you have an RH negative mother and an RH positive fetus, what might happen? So that concludes our section on blood typing. Next, we'll move into leukocytes.